There's no such thing as the perfect anime. Even the greatest anime ever made has at least a couple things wrong with it. Just like how in FMA Brotherhood, the comedy isn't really that funny to me, or how in Evangelion, you have to become an investigative journalist just to figure out its ending. <laughs> But these shows are at least consistently incredible throughout their runtimes, always leaving you on the edge of your seat across multiple episodes or seasons, unlike one anime. The Promised Neverland had one of the most depressing foursome grace I have ever seen. In the sense that season 1 was an instant classic, a true masterpiece, while season 2 is just despised by the majority of people who watch it. For good reason too. Season 2 is like it's been written by Tommy Wiseau overdosing on ketamine. In this video, I'll be going through The Promised Neverland season 1 and season 2, highlighting why season 1 is so fantastic and why its sequel is such a disappointment. There will be major spoilers for the entire series in this video, but just watch the video anyway. So, let's begin. The show begins with three kids, Emma, Ray and Norman behind a giant gate, looking beyond and wondering what lies within it. This is already a great establishing shot, the intimidatingly large scale of everything inside the gate tells us that whatever does lie beyond it is probably something not to be messed with. Skipping ahead, we realise that Emma, Ray and Norman are all in an orphanage, accompanied by a bunch of other kids and one guardian, the mum. Now, as you probably noticed, this isn't a normal orphanage. All the kids have numbers on their necks like cattle, there's only one adult in the entire facility and as we see later, they all have to do these oddly intimidating exams despite being so young. During a game of tag, we are shown our three main characters' strengths and weaknesses. Emma is physically stronger and more athletic than the others. Norman is the polar opposite to Emma, lacking physical strength but is a complete genius. And Ray often avoids confrontation, sitting aside while the others play tag and instead reading whilst tracking the time. In another game of tag, the three stumble upon a fence deep in the forest, explaining how their mum always says to never venture beyond it as it could be potentially dangerous, with others soon following and stating their goals for once they leave the orphanage. <laughs> And then we see Connie. Now, Connie may seem like a random side character at first, but her role in the story is extremely important. This is further proved by the following scene, in which it is revealed that Connie's going to be leaving the orphanage because she got adopted. Once she leaves, Emma notices that she left her toy behind, a stuffed bunny. And so, accompany each other, both Emma and Norman venture into the now open gate and find a truck. With no one around, the two look into the truck and... With the only sign of life being thorny flowers coming out of her chest, the two freak out and accidentally cause some noise with someone or something noticing. Peeking out from under the truck, they see three giant demons drooling over Connie's lifeless body, explaining how all humans produced on this farm are high quality meats intended for the rich. Putting two and two together, we figure out that this farm they talk of is actually the orphanage, and that their mum, now known as Isabella, is just a cattleman, raising the kids to just have them slaughtered and devoured by demons. Running away, Emma and Norman make it back to the orphanage, and after a brief crisis, decide to escape with everyone. But unfortunately for them, they left the bunny behind at the gate, and it's picked up by none other than Isabella. And that was just the first episode. Have a viewer learned so much yet even more is left up in the air, it's done in such an amazing way. The next day, Emma and Norman come to the agreement that they have to act like nothing happened, otherwise they'll be caught and probably killed. Norman then figures out that the quality of the meat varies from certain factors such as intelligence and age, but older and smarter being higher quality. Coming up with a brief plan, the two decide to get everyone out during the day, then realising that not only will there be demons coming after them, but also there's a giant war between them and the outside world. Returning to the group after hearing a bell, it is revealed that a child has gone missing and so Isabella looks for and retrieves the child extremely quickly, leaving Norman questioning if his track is implanted on every orphan. We then see Ray looking out of a window and, oh my god, it's literally me! Despite suspicions arising from both Isabella and Ray, Emma and Norman meet at night to find supplies in order to get over the war. Before they get a chance to test them out, however, Ray shows himself and questions what exactly happened at the gate that night. Learning the truth, Ray is, at first, hesitant to help them with their plan due to the vast amount of roadblocks in their way, but eventually subsides and agrees to help them. But once again, their plans are halted when a new caregiver arrives at the orphanage. Sister Crone, along with an infant baby called Carol. Google. During a meeting, the three discuss this new and other roadblocks, along with how to figure out where the tracking devices are implanted on the human body. And with Carol still being a baby, Emma sets off to find her and see if she has any scars on her body, which would lead to a tracking device. But before that, Sister Crone and Isabella meet and discuss her newfound duties within the orphanage. But Isabella also has an idea of who figured out what the kids are really raised for. Skipping forward to Emma, and she discovers a bump behind Connie's ear that may lead to the discovery of a trap 
Chaka, whilst a new character begins to become curious, Gilda. At night, we see Isabella talking to a mysterious figure using a radio system about how three of the kids are ready to be shipped out, with a jump cut to a group of demons saying how they can't mess up his meal and how they should offer their praises to him. This is never brought up again, and you'll see later on why. The next day, the three kids decide that to get everyone out, they should play tag, just so the little ones don't freak out and so they can practice without suspicion. This, in return, makes Sister Crone suspicious, so she wants to play tag as well. And so during it, she's able to intimidate everyone with her speed and strength, and it seems as if she's already suspicious of Emma, as before catching her, she states that if she saw what happened that night, then she's on her side. Oh yes, I would definitely trust the average woman without makeup, jump scaring me like it's Five Nights at Freddy's. Later that day, Emma, Ray, and Norman begin to suspect that there's a traitor among the kids leaking info to Isabella, due to the fact that she seems to not really be doing that much to figure out who saw the truth. And this is where the psychological aspect of the show comes into play heavily. In the next scene, Emma glances at Isabella, Sister Crone, Gilda, and others just Wait, staring at her, making her freak out and become paranoid. Because in reality, the kids are pretty much powerless against these demons and adults. It's just like when you try to hide that you've broken something as a kid, but your parents definitely know they're just waiting for you to say it. As Norman places something unknown in a bag, we cut to Sister Crone and Isabella having a little meeting. It is here that Isabella reveals that she knows what Sister Crone is up to, but this has no effect on her, because she just goes to her room and destroys her doll. As strange as this scene really is, it does show us that Isabella does have a lot of psychological power as a human, and that Sister Crone just don't give a fuck. The next day, the three decide to play tag and escape as teams just because the little ones would just perish by themselves and that they should tell Don and Gilda, the other elders orphans, the truth about their situation. And after playing around a tag just to practice everyone's escape, Norman reveals that the escape will be carried out in 10 days on November the 8th. Emma's reaction, being one of concern for not having enough time to practice is pretty justified, but Ray almost seems a bit agitated, saying how they should have had at least a month until the next shipping day. When I first saw this, I immediately knew something wasn't right, even with Norman's fine judgment judgment on this escape day, they just seems annoyed unnecessarily. That night, the three talk to Gilda and Don, with Gilda already being suspicious, but Don being such a brainlet, he just thinks they're joking. With a little bit of convincing and lying from Norman, Don and Gilda agree to help with the plan, with Norman laying a trap just in case they're informants, that being if one of them goes searching for what Norman hid under his bed earlier, being a rope, then they're the informant. That night, Gilda slips out of their room and goes to speak with Sister Crone, while an unknown person slips a note under Isabella's door, saying that the rope is under beneath Norman's bed. Turns out that Gilda was called to Sister Crone's room for a well-being checkup, but when she figures out that Gilda knows everything, she gets up in her face and does some um, looks maxing shit. Like look at that jawline dude, she's fucking giga chat. So now we know that Gilda isn't the traitor, but what about Don? The next night, Norman and Ray check the spot for the rope, with it now being taken. As Ray confirms that it's Don being the traitor, Norman ignores him completely and instead points the finger right at Ray, saying that he's the traitor. This revelation was done extremely well, because although Ray was definitely suspicious with a lot of things, there were scenes where Don and Gilda are both the same, speaking to Isabella or just staring at Emma. Ray explains how he's been Isabella's subordinate for a long time, saying how he's known what really goes on at the orphanage for a while now. And instead of cutting him off completely, Norman just asks for three things from him. One, to continue to spend time with everyone like before and to guarantee their safety. Two, release all the info he has to them. And three, come to their side instead of Isabella's. From Norman's request, it's revealed that Ray was the one who pushed Norman and Emma into seeing the truth and thus putting together a plan. So, Ray has been pulling the strings for a long time, pretty much, cooperating with Isabella so he doesn't get shipped out right away, and that if he gave her info, he would be rewarded with so-called drunk from her perspective, which in return led to Ray figuring out how to break the tracking devices. But even with Ray's monologue, it's, he's still one to be trusted. He's acting pretty mental, and he even says that he's not an enemy, but also isn't an ally. And under only one condition, he'll become their ace and give them info about Isabella whilst leaking lies to her as well. That condition is to trick Emma and only escape with the three of them, Don and Gilda, as the little ones would be a burden on their escape. With Norman reluctantly agreeing, Ray leaves to meet with Isabella and, like he promised, didn't sell them out to Isabella. But with some questions answered, even more or have realized. We know that Ray was the traitor, but who's really pulling the string? Ray seems like he's got the upper hand of it, Isabella, but how much does she really know about their plan? Before those questions can even begin to be answered, I wanted to share an example of a filler scene in the show, because although they don't add a lot to the overall plot, they do to each character and their personality. For example, in one of Norman's dreams, he imagines being right at the exit to the wall, but as he looks back around, everyone is dead, with the same flowers growing out of Connie growing out of everyone as well. As Norman notices Emma dead on the floor, he grits onto her, just hoping she has any life left in her. That is, until... Ah! 
Although this scene adds little to nothing to the show, it's still a great reminder of just how terrifying their situation really is. The next day, the three meet up and Ray comes out and just straight up says to Emma that he's the traitor. Emma, obviously dumbfounded, questions why he would even be Isabella's subordinate. Ray then explains that he would have told them everything when they got back from the gate that night, but they left the bunny behind and so he had to cover things up for them. Later that night, all five of the kids meet up with Ray sharing some info, that being how Isabella disappears into a secret room between a bedroom and her own room every night at 8. Further adding that she goes there to speak to headquarters and that the security measures on the room are unknown and it's probably a bad idea to go check. But of course, Don being the absolute fucking genius that he is, decides to go anyway with Gilda following. Gilda is at least hesitant to do so, but goddamn there is nothing but mush and TV static going on in Don's brain. Although they do eventually find the secret room, they find it to be locked as the door to Isabella's bedroom opens up. Turns out it's not Isabella, but it's actually Phil, a character that seems insignificant right now, but is actually pretty integral to the entire series. Over in a separate room, the main three are again pondering their escape and things they need to consider. The escape plan has three steps. One, get over the wall and escape. Two, get away from the orphanage safely. And three, establish a way to survive outside and become self-reliant. Now for the time being, that last step seems like a no-brainer, but as we'll see in the second season, it's just kind of executed very poorly. And back to <laughs> Doodlehead Don, and he's just successfully stolen Isabella's key to the secret room. Successfully being a bit of an overstatement. Switching back to our main three, and Emma has just revealed someone who has the possibility of being an ally. William Minerva, the previous owner of many of the orphanage's books that might just be conveying a message to the children through them, with that message being shown through Morse code. I really like this. In a lot of games and anime, a secret message is usually figured out through finding fucking pieces of paper, or a spooky voice recording of a man dropping a couple turds in the toilet. And although using Morse code as a substitute isn't that special, it was just nice to see a bit more thought put into it. With Norman completing the code, it reads, Run, Doubt, Danger, Truth, Monster, and Farm. With the three concluding that it's likely an ally from the outside world, trying to help them and just maybe they think there could be human civilization beyond the wall. Switching back to Don and Gilda, and the two have managed to get into Isabella's secret room, finding Connie's stuffed bunny, along with other mementos from already harvested kids. This is massive, as Norman before lied and said that Connie and the other children were still alive, with this new revelation contradicting that. Whilst that happens, Norman figures out the final page of Morse code, reading Promise, along with a book with absolutely no Morse code. As Don stumbles into another bookshelf, another secret room opens up, revealing multiple communication devices, and after some back and forth between the two, they hear Isabella enter the bedroom. Narrowly escaping her, the two go to meet up with the rest of the group, with a meeting commencing later that evening. With Don understandably confronting the group on their actual situation, the three reveal the truth to the pair, and after some conflict within the group, all is well and apologies are given. This entire sequence was really good. It really puts a lot of humanity into Don and Gilda, showing us that they aren't just random throwaway characters, but are instead important to everyone's own well-being and the overall story. The next day, the group begins preparations for an investigation on the outside world past the war, with Ray planning to give Isabella false info to create a situation where she wouldn't look at their trackers, as we are also told that Ray's shipment might be a bit closer than we think. As the group walk deeper into the forest, we see Sister Crone mewing at the kids beside a tree, with her then revealing that she knows that they know the truth, and proposes an idea to join forces. As she reveals cattle numbers on her neck, Sister Crone explains that girls who meet certain requirements before being shipped will be given two options, either to become a mum or die. But even as a mum, you'll be installed with a chip so that if you take even one step outside the farm, you'll be electrocuted and killed. They eventually agree to join forces with Sister Crone agreeing to let them escape. That night, after a meeting with the group discussing Sister Crone's possible influences, Emma and Norman go to meet with her, whilst Isabella finds and opens a package containing a suitcase and a letter. Ooh, who is it for? I don't know. Back to Emma and Norman, the two ask Sister Crone to show them the tool that receives the signal from the tracking devices. Once handed to them, Sister Crone explains how it only shows the current location of someone, but it can't specify who it is. With that, she also confirms that the tracking devices are in the back of the child's ear, but that she doesn't know how to break them, just that it sends out a signal to the tool and to headquarters when it is broken. With the only known way to contradict that being to cut off your own ear, Sister Crone suggests using the tools from the infirmary to do so. The pair then asks Sister Crone her age, that being 26, in which she reveals that Isabella is 31. But as they learn about the area's low security and as Sister Crone grows more intimidating, the pair decide to leave. And just before the night ends, Ray receives his last reward, a camera. I see. So nothing shows up here at first. Gotta make a move.
The next day, the group go over their plan to investigate the outside world, with Norman and Emma climbing the wall for inspections. With our three MCs moving to a new location, Norman reveals to Ray that Sister Crone knows that they can break the tracking devices now, asking if their escape day can be moved up. Pulling out the camera, Ray states that he's now obtained all the parts he needs to do so, with the next scene showing Sister Crone having a revelation to search just in case they do have all those parts. As she begins searching Ray's bed, she finds a piece of paper, the paper supposedly outlining a weakness of Isabella's. Returning to her room, Sister Crone is pretty delighted with this info, but before she can ponder on it anymore, Isabella knocks on her door. Opening it, Isabella hands Sister Crone a letter from headquarters, an involuntary separation letter. It reads, Number 18684. Sister Crone, we hereby appoint you to be mum for Plant 4. Sister Crone has lost against Isabella, but even so, she's still not ready to give up. Exiting the orphanage and meeting with a figure called Grandma, Sister Crone pulls out the paper she found under Ray's bed. She explains to Grandma that in addition to what's on the note, the perfect scorers in the farm are trying to escape, but with no sufficient evidence to back up her statements, Grandma just brushes them off, saying how Isabella is a necessary pawn and that Sister Crone is being troublesome. With Grandma leaving, Sister Crone is left alone with her own thoughts, or at least, she thinks she's alone. As she tries her hardest to escape, we see flashbacks of her training to become a mum in a farm, with multiple other women doing the same as her. And finally, we see what the flowers and the bodies are really used for, killing, with the flowers blooming whenever the victim is dead. Which makes a lot of sense, I mean these are bloodthirsty demons here, yet Connie's body wasn't torn up or anything, just lifeless. Switching back to the group, they begin their plan to inspect the outside world, but before they can do anything, Isabella says to Ray that Sister Crone has been eliminating. Ray, being surprised, runs to Sister Crone's room just to find nothing. And before he can say anything, Isabella says that their deal is over. Also, I find it really interesting that she always refers to him as a useful dog, like it's a Sydney train at 2am. Give you a big hug. It really shows how she just sees the children as farm animals. With the situation changing, Isabella locks Ray in the room and proceeds to go find Emma and Norman, tracking them down using the tracking tool. Seeing Isabella exit the orphanage, Don finds Ray and breaks the door down, setting him free. Don, Gilda and Ray go to stop Isabella, but not before she finds Norman and Emma at the wall. Dropping her motherly act entirely, she reintroduces herself, even stating that at that moment, it's just the caretaker and the children meant to be food. But even so, she still says she loves them, wanting them to stop resisting so that they don't suffer. So is she bending the truth to try and trick them, or are those words generally from a loving place? Arguing is now futile, as Emma goes back and forth with Isabella, only to be stopped by Norman. But they haven't exactly given up yet. <sighs> Never mind. This is more devastating than it seems, as now she can't run so their escape date must be pushed back a month or so, right around Ray's shipment. As the other three arrive at the conflict, Isabella tells them some devastating news. The higher ups have given a notice for Norman's shipment date the very next day. As Gilda, Ray and Don express their frustrations outside, Norman sits beside Emma, trying his best to remain calm, with him then breaking down whilst getting water for Emma because she can't move. As Norman returns to Emma's room, he finds Ray there as well, only for them to state that he is going to escape the next day, or more precisely, have him disable his tracker and hide out in the forest until everyone else can escape. Even with this and then some, Norman still isn't convinced that it'll work. Instead, he states that they can have his life, but he'll destroy what Isabella has plotted to make sure the escape for everyone else succeeds. But even so, Emma proposes an idea to have Ray and Norman break a bone or get sick to push back their shipments. As the three are all high quality, it would need to be in perfect condition to be shipped. Opposing Emma's idea but agreeing to Ray's eventually, he's handed a tool to disable his tracking device whilst not notifying Isabella. As Norman asks how Ray found out the truth about the house, Ray explains that he knew from the beginning, further explaining how he's been able to retain his memories since he was just a fetus. He then points out that after the tracking devices were implanted into babies, they would be separated into groups of five, with Ray passing through a dark tunnel eventually arriving at the orphanage, which could only mean that past the gate lights headquarters and the adjacent five farms. So with this gate's exit being impossible to escape from, their only option is to climb the gigantic wall, with her escape now being conducted once Emma's leg has healed. The next day, everyone's trying their best to behave as they always do, as Norman sprints to the wall with some rope and ties it to a tree. Using the rope as assistance, Norman makes it on top of the wall and sees nothing but trees for miles. Later that evening, as the group all wait nervously, we see Isabella check her tracker. 
as Norman returns completely disregarding the plan that was set in place. That night, Ray and Emma confront Norman on this decision, but before they can make any argument, Norman tells them some crucial info that we as the viewer didn't even know. There's a cliff beyond the wall, wide, long and deep, of certain death awaiting anyone who falls in. Along with that, Norman figured out that this farm and surrounding farms are on a hexagonal property surrounded by a cliff, and that the section west of their farm was probably headquarters, also containing a bridge over the cliff. Before more can even be said, the group are interrupted with Norman handing back Ray's device, with their conversation ending with a farewell group hug. As he packs up his stuff, Norman finds an old string phone he and Emma once used when he was sick as a young child, so that they could still talk to each other. I like this scene a lot, especially with it being the only thing he's packed. It shows a lot of sentimental value and shows us the impact Emma has had on his life. As everyone finishes saying their goodbyes to Norman, Emma has another idea in mind. Running at Norman and tackling him, she tries to disable his tracker and get him to run away, but without hesitation, Norman pushes her away. As an argument begins to unfold, it's quickly ended by Isabella, whispering to Emma that she'll kill her if she starts another commotion. But before he leaves, he says his final farewell to Emma and Ray, then leaves the house to meet his demise. As Isabella walks to the gate with Norman, he asks her one simple question. Are you happy? It startles her, replying yes because she was able to meet someone like Norman. I do believe this to be true, but the fact that it initially startled her leads me to believe that she may have a little bit of guilt somewhere in her heart. As they enter the gate, Isabella asks Norman to wait inside a room, but the only thing we have to go off is a shocked look on Norman's face, as if he's found out about something or seen someone. Back at the farm, both Emma and Ray are very depressed, to the point where even Ray suggests that they just give up and die. As Emma returns to her room, she breaks down in tears, but is quickly stopped when Isabella enters her room. She taunts her with statements like, you can't do anything on your own. But even so, Isabella even says that she'll recommend her to become a mum for the farm, but Emma still declines the offer, her will to save all the kids just being too strong. As the days go by, we eventually arrive at Ray's last night before he's shipped away, which coincidentally is his birthday. What a fun celebration that will be. <laughs> all right, everyone, are you all ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're ready. Okay, ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hurry up. Come here. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Happy birthday! Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, wow, oh my god, thank you guys so much. You coming out drinking? Barry, you coming out drinking? It's your birthday, we gotta get hammered, bro. Oh yeah, oh. Sorry guys, I can't, don't think I'll be able to make it. Oh, what, what, why man, it's your birthday, come on, so don't tell me you're working. Oh, no, no, I'm not working, I'm not working. Uh, so it turns out that I need to go get shipped to be eaten by demons. Really? Oh, man. Yeah, what really? the hell, really? bro? But as Emma meets with Ray, it's revealed that Emma still hasn't given up. Because Isabella had to have her eyes peeled on both Emma and Ray after Norman's shipment, Emma left everything to Don and Gilda to figure out. With her escape finally planned out, there are still just two problems left. Firstly, Isabella's watchful eyes, which in order to escape, they'll need to separate her from the babies to shake her off. And secondly, the cliff past the wall. They can't go to the bridge to the west as security will be tight once notified about an escape. So to counter that, Ray will seal off Isabella's secret room, light the orphanage on fire so that they can evacuate everyone and escape whilst Isabella's busy putting the fire out. Even with this seemingly perfect plan, what if Isabella just decides, fuck the house, I'm going after the kids? Well, to counter that, Ray pours petrol on himself, meaning that since he's the top scorer and it's his shipment day, it would be a bad idea on Isabella's part to abandon him. As midnight rolls around, Ray lights a match and drops it, with Emma charging right towards him. Switching to Isabella, we see her doing her usual nightly duties as the mother of the farm, right until she hears Ray's name being screamed out. Running towards the room and opening the door, we see that the entire room has been engulfed in flames, with only Emma to be seen. Realising what Ray did to himself, Isabella runs back out of the room and orders Gilda to get everyone outside, with the exception that the babies need to be in her own room. Charging back in, Isabella tries using a fire extinguisher. I say tries, as after like 3 seconds it just lets out a pathetic trickle of pre-cum instead of like an entire load. Looking back, Emma is nowhere to be seen. Using her tracker to locate her, she finds nothing but a bucket. Looking inside, she sees Emma Emma's own ear, as she now realises what's happening. Switching to Emma, we see her meet up with the rest of the kids, including Ray. That Emma caught the match from earlier, with some of the other kids helping lay out a fake Ray to be engulfed instead of himself. As everyone begins to escape, we are told that some of the other kids were let in on the secrets of the house, so that they would be more willing to escape, including Nat, Anna, Lanian, and Toma. Making it to the war, it is said that Emma and Nat will climb up first, then pulling everyone else up afterwards. But as we switch back to Isabella, we see that she's basically 
lost her mind. Still not willing to let Namor get away, but not all of them are actually escaping. As we see everyone getting pulled up onto the wall, we have a flashback to a conversation between Emma and Phil, with Emma telling him the truth, but with Phil, despite being so young, already having his suspicions. I like that about this show. It made me think that a lot of these characters could actually exist without it being a TV show. It's immersive. With all that new info, we realise that the really young kids, the quote unquote liabilities, are being left in charge of Phil, with Emma vowing to return in the next two years to save them and the kids in the other plants. But before they can make any progress, Isabella alerts headquarters about the escape, with an alarm going off and maximum security being enforced. So instead, to raise surprise, they cross over the cliff instead of the bridge, with Don throwing a rope across and around a tree, forming a flying fox, or if you're a boring American, please save me Donald Trump, a zipline propaganda. With Don crossing first, Lanny and Antoma then use their devices they made earlier to get their own ropes across the cliff, with Don tying those up and forming two more flying foxes. With Ray completely thwarted with their training, he has a vision of Norman standing next to him, with the two conversing about how they finally made it to a scenery they thought they would never see. With Isabella finding out that they haven't even made it to the bridge, she realises what the kids are up to, as we see that only five more need to cross over. And with some of the younger ones scared of falling, this gave Isabella some time to catch up a bit. Now, with just Emma needing to cross, Isabella finally catches up to them, but with no way to stop her, Emma makes her way across the cliff, with the flying foxes then being severed, leaving Isabella alone with her own thoughts. As she stands upon the wall, she has visions of when she was once a child in a farm talking with a boy named Leslie as he plays an instrument. Don't know what it's called, it just kind of sounds cool. The scene eventually shows Isabella on her shipment day, finding out the truth about everything, which then progresses to her training to become a mum and becoming pregnant. Now, in a world where most men end up dead, I don't know how she became pregnant. Unless, uh, maybe a demon could? The scene finally ends with Isabella being a mum at her own plant, with Ray as a young child. Hey mom, why'd you give birth to me? Well, Ray, I did it to survive. This sequence was really cool, but once it gave Isabella at least some level of humanity, showing us that she wasn't always so cruel. And watching it for the first time, I really had no idea Ray was Isabella's son. By rewatching it now, I now see all the hints and similarities between the two, showing that it wasn't some random thing they added in the last second, but something it has been telling us for a while now. As we switch back to Isabella, she realizes and accepts defeat, and instead wishes them luck and support with their escape, with her then returning to the rest of the kids that were left behind, and thus, as they sprint for their lives, they finally make it to the edge of their immediate forest surrounding the wall, just as the sun comes up, as their escape plan finally becomes a reality. And that's the first season, and god damn, that was great! And it's not just me who thinks that either, just look at my anime list for a second, and you can tell that this show was an instant classic on its release, but I wish I could say the same about the second season. Now. As much as I wish I could sit here, jerk off the first season, we have to move on to the second season. Because to really appreciate how good the first season is, we have to know how dog shit this second season really is. So let's begin and watch one of the worst fours from Grace in anime history. Season 2 of The Promised Neverland begins with everyone that had previously escaped running in a dark forest from a giant demon trying to eat them. This is just not a good start to the season. With how the first season began with questions and mysteries to keep the viewer intrigued right away, the second season just answers the question of what's beyond the wall, which is boring. You could question whether they'll survive or not, but come on, there's 11 fucking episodes. Do you think they would die in the first one? Jumping back a little bit to before this attack, and we see everyone exploring the forest, surrounded by giant trees and strange creatures. After discussing their thoughts on their escape, Don and Gilda arrive, and we find out that they need to head southeast. But hold up, shut the fuck up, because look up- it's William Minerva's, the one who put the codes and shit in the books from last season, and it was given to them by Norman after he left. Taking the pen apart, a hologram pops up what? When, when the fuck was this sort of technology introduced? If there are holograms in this world, then why does Isabella communicate using walkie talkies and shit as seen in the first season? On the hologram is the combination B0114, their coordinates on a map, along with the hologram's logo that, when touched, brings up a login, and by using the book with no Morse code from last season, the group is able to find its password, human. Entering her password comes up with a message, if you need help, come visit me, I'm located at B0632, William Minerva. With a location, finally settled, the group 
group set out on their journey, using the books Minerva left them to help guide them towards survival. Later on, as demons from headquarters pinpoint their direction, the group run into that big demon from the start of the episode, with Don and Gilda leading the kids away, with Emma seen following due to Ray's request. As Ray tries to lead her into a trap, he throws up his lantern, with the demon's head being severed by a headquarters demon instead. With the demons revealing that they know he's hiding, Ray first writes down a message to the group saying to go to B0632, and that there's pursuers, and then he reveals himself, afterwards running away. Now, this may seem like a smart play, that being writing what he did, which it very well could have been, but as we see later on, it was fucking stupid, like Ray just lost brain cells between seasons or some shit. Unbeknownst to the others of Ray's encounter, Emma points them downhill, with herself going to check it out, uh, Emma? or attempting to. With her wound from her ear opening back up, Emma begins to lose more blood, but not before a mysterious figure points them towards what may be safe. Skeptical, the group asks it to reveal its face, but as they smirk, we switch back to Ray, finally being courted by the headquarters demons. As he collapses from exhaustion, Ray is then saved by another strange figure, with a chase then starting, but soon ending with an explosion. Waking up, Ray finds himself underground, soon finding Emma and they reveal what happened to each other, with the first figure then revealing herself to be a friend. She leads Ray and Emma to the rest of the group, but not before Ray asks a simple question. Why are demons helping humans, as it is revealed that they and the other figure are both demons. <laughs> As it dawns on two that the other kids could have been devoured by these demons, Emma yells at the demons asking if the rest of the kids are safe, despite no actual malice in the two demons that we know of. In fact, as Emma runs away with Ray chasing her, the male demon even gives them directions to the kids. As they both find the kids, the two demons also arrive and explain themselves as Mujika and Sonju, two demons that don't eat nor intend to eat humans. Later that day, Sonju reveals to Emma and Ray that they chose not to eat humans due to religious reasons and that he has no interest in the farm's ideology prophet or authority. This is one new theme within this season that's actually pretty cool. Just like how the demons enslave and raise humans, we do the same to various farm animals in real life. And just like Sonju, depending on your religion or beliefs, you may have varying viewpoints towards animals and farms being raised to be eaten by humans. Asking what happened to humanity, Sonju reveals that the world's been like this for a while, as he begins a tale of what used to be. Before, there were abundant humans for demons to eat, but as humans began fighting back and killing even more demons, it created endless killing and constant fear, with a compromise eventually being proposed to end this war, to segregate and split the world in two, one side demons and the other humans, and so demons wouldn't have to hunt, humans were left behind to be bred and eaten instead, starting the farms. It had been about a thousand years since that agreement, with the entire group being directly in the demon side of the world. As Emma and Ray get excited at the fact that there's even just a human world, Sonja you shot him down by saying that as a part of an agreement, no one can cross over each side. Yet, the two still haven't given up hope. But oh, remember when Ray wrote down Minerva's coordinates on that tree? Well, the demons from headquarters found that same tree. You donkeys come, Ray. You're a fucking idiot. That's another problem in this season. All the characters just feel like they're missing their intelligence from season one. And that's not the only thing this season is apparently missing. As the group plan to meet up with Minerva and ask how to get to the human world, Sonju tells them that to go southeast, it'll take five days to leave the forest. So he and Mujika teach from the basics on how to survive, like cooking and hunting and other shit, whilst leading them out of the forest. For the next five minutes or so, it's just them learning how to do this shit, and oh my god, is it fucking boring. Where's the excitement the first season had? What made season one so special was how they used their intelligence to get through tough situations, but now those types of scenes are replaced with straightforward and dull training segments with little value in the show's progression. Boring. Skipping forward and we find Emma training with Sonju as she shoots a live bird. As they find it, still barely alive, Sonju hands Emma a goopner. You might recognize is this plant from when Sister Crone was killed, and as we'll see once it blooms, when they found Connie. In this world, food is dedicated to the gods, and if accepted, the Goopna will bloom. It's a traditional practice upon demons, and it also works to drain the blood of an animal, preserving the meat for a longer time. Piercing the heart of a bird, Emma is shaken up by having to do this, further seeing when she returns home, but she seems a lot more quiet than usual. Finally, after days of travelling, they make it out of the forest and discover a large and vast desert wasteland. After wishing them farewell, Sonju and Mujika say their goodbyes, but not before Mujika gives Emma an amulet that she hopes will protect her. After a group leaves, Sonju and Mujika talk about how handing them over to the farm could actually grant them comfortable living conditions for six months or so, because despite not eating humans because of their religion, they only really saved them out of curiosity, or so we thought, as Sonju reveals that if they live and breed outside the walls, they'll be able to hunt and eat their offspring for generations as it doesn't go against their religion. Damn, what a plot twist. Except I wish it was shown in a way where it wasn't just told, but shown, like how season one dealt with this type of Shit. Also, this is never brought up again. I guess it's just to make Sonju look like a wanker. As Sonju goes to take care of 
business, we are shown that night that he meant killing the demons from headquarters. Switching back to the kids, they finally arrived at their designation, but with nothing around in the scenery or the map, they used a pen to figure out what to do. It shows 108 1501 and so going to page 108 line 15 in a book comes up with history entering it and they're greeted with a map followed by the words welcome and unlocked i really hate this aspect in this season in season one they had to use their heads to figure out a way around a situation but in this season it's just like pen after finding the entrance and subsequently entering the bunker, they find some switches that, when turned on, activate the bunker's electricity. They then find a letter that reads, Congratulations on arriving. I'm sorry I cannot celebrate it with you in person. This shelter is yours. William Minerva. At last, they find shelter, equipped with food, water, crops, a secret escape route, and various means of protection and security, such as a radio. Using the radio, they are able to hack into the regular check-in to headquarters, meaning that at some point they will be able to get information on the house and the kids still there. The next day, they discover a strange door containing a keyhole with Morse code that reads PEN. This fucking pen, man. Once unlocked and entered, they find a room containing a single chair and a phone. Fucking Sea Dog VA's house, dude. At the same time, some of the other kids discover another room. This one with the word help plastered all over the wall, as if someone was desperately trying to escape something. Back to Emma and the others, the phone rings and, when picked up, William Minerva announces himself through a voice recording. I don't know how this is possible. Like, how does a phone ring and the person that rang is just a voice recording? Like, I get it, there's demons and shit everywhere and it's a different world. But come on, man. As the recording continues, it's revealed that Minerva's real name is James Rattry, and that he used to work as the gatekeeper. But after seeing what happens to the kids over and over again, he decides to help them out by slipping them clues under a fake name. But eventually, he was caught and pursued as a traitor. Eventually, he gives them two options one, to live in a shelter forever, or two, to go to the human world. Which, when the word future is entered into the hologram, a map is shown showing where the human world is. And so, they make a plan to rescue the kids still at the farms, bring them to the shelter, and eventually go to the human world. What follows is two minutes of again another training and preparation sequence that feels very lazy and boring to watch. After checking the farm's trench mission once again to find nothing, we switch to Isabella, who after last season has been in prison due to her letting the kids escape as she shows remorse and sympathy for the kids. With a figure known as Grandma giving her a calm earful, she asks, would you like to see them? Referring to the kids. Switching to the kids as they're all preparing to head to sleep, out of nowhere, a giant explosion occurs, busting the entrance to the bunker wide open, with humans in military gear then entering, scouring the entire place. I knew this would fucking happen. When you're going out hunting all the time, when you know you yourself are being hunted, it's fucking stupid, seeing as they had everything they would need in the bunker. As everyone hides, they realise that two people were missing from the group. Don and... Oh, fuck, he's this little cunt. Uh, I don't fucking care. Beating up with the rest of the group, they all finally make their way to a secret escape tunnel, which turns out to not be so secret because one of the bad guys catch up to them. Luckily, they are able to shoot them with their bows. They eventually make their way out of the bunker, but not before properly being captured. But before Emma and Ray can surrender, a giant demon comes out of nowhere and devours the humans from headquarters. It's all just plot convenience. In the first season, there was never something like this as it was actually written really well. But in this season, it's just, oh no. We got captured. Oh, don't worry. A giant demon just came out of nowhere and only got the bad guys. Oh, or someone or something just magically appearing and helping the group out. As they shoot the demon with an arrow directly in its eye, they all make a run for it. Simultaneously, the demons from headquarters give Isabella a chance. If the current operation fails, which it did miserably, they'll leave everything to her to get the kids back. And if she succeeds, they'll essentially give her freedom, along with something else unknown to us at the time. The conversation ends with Isabella saying how she'll get back the children who betrayed her. Just fucking Stupid. First of all, no one betrayed you. And secondly, weren't you just saying how the kids will escape no matter what headquarters does? And she seemed like she actually did love them as a mother literally like three minutes ago. How can someone change so quickly just by saying they'll be given some shit? Starting the next episode, we're in a town crawling with demons, as two demons talk about the Gracefield farm escape. The same escape Emma and the others were a part of. And that they're probably dead, but despite their odds, everyone in the group is still alive, having to collect whatever scraps they can whilst disguising themselves as demons in town living in an abandoned church just out of that town. With everyone else sleeping, Emma's still wide awake as she reevaluates her actions, saying how she's starting to hate herself and that she thought she could protect and save everyone, but yet they all keep getting into life-threatening situations. Her monologue is soon stopped by Ray, who comforts her, saying how they're doing the right thing for everyone. As the others awaken, 
Lanny and Antoma ask to help come out in search of food and supplies, seeing as they've made well done demon disguises and can help remove their scent using... Is that fucking weed? What the fuck is that? Emma agrees, but before they can go out, an elderly demon arrives at the church. Due to the numbing of his senses because of old age, the demon knows that they're there, but he doesn't seem to know that they're humans, not demons. As he lays down food to appease the god of his religion, he basically says how the demon world is going to shit, with not enough human meat being provided to demons and that soon the town will become wild. As the demon leaves, Emma realises that he was praying to his family, which in return makes Emma empathise with the demons more. Switching back to the demons from town, we see now what the elderly demon meant when he said the town would become wild, as we see two young demons morphed with extra limbs and disfigured bodies, meaning that most demons need human flesh to survive. And hearing the kids from Grace Field are still alive, they decide to go look for them in hopes of feeding them to the disfigured demons to stop their so-called degeneration. While in town, Lanny and Antoma are knocked off by the same demons from before, as they realise that they're humans. Running away, Don and Gilda lead Lanian and Toma back to the hideout, as Ray and Emma lure the demons away. Seemingly cornered by five extra demons at this point, along with the other two, one of these unseen demons slashes both of the other one's throats, killing them, in which he then reveals himself to be Norman. I actually thought this was a good plot twist, I just wasn't expecting it at all, and it caught me off guard, but not in a this is fucking stupid type of way, like a lot of this season has been so far. Breaking down in tears, Emma runs into Norman arms, questioning what happened to him, in which he pauses, and states that he was sent to a different farm. Now, Norman could just be a vapor who needs a deep breath every time he speaks, but I think it's more likely that his pause is him being reluctant to give an answer, making me question if his intentions are pure. As the other so-called demons reveal themselves to also be human, we cut to the castle, in which Norman greets the rest of the escapees. Explaining himself, Norman says that he was transferred to a testing site for children called Lambda 7214, in which demons and adults would execute experiments onto them in order to mass produce more high grade meat, which accidentally would result in abnormal growth growth in muscles, sense, etc, making them stronger and more intelligent. With the help of a supporter of Minerva called me, Norman was able to destroy Lambda and had escaped with the other children, and using the various experiment data from there, he created a drug that will cause demons to degenerate, like what was happening to the young demons before. Essentially, if demons don't eat humans, they'll turn into the ones like we saw in the forest, losing all their intelligence, and Norman just made a drug that'll cause that no matter what. His reason? To make demons go extinct and create a paradise for humans in the demon world. And as you might think, Emma's not so on board with the idea, as once Norman leaves later on, she confides in Ray, asking if there's another way without annihilation or conflict. And as naive as it sounds, the demons still have families and friends, and all the same things humans have. It's just that they need to eat humans to survive, otherwise they'll just go wild. So, the next day, the two go to speak to Norman, but before they can, are greeted with some of his crew, Zazi, who isn't there at this time, Cislo, Barbara, and Vincent. I can't tell whether I like them or not, because although they add variety to the type of characters in the story, I can't help but think their personalities were made like how they were, make the story a bit more quirky. This is further proof when they all talk about how much they love killing and eating and torturing demons, and that everyone who doesn't agree with their plan is wrong. I especially dislike Barbara, it's like she was added to just be annoying, like at least Cislo and Vincent kind of more chill about it, but they all kind of just suck off Norman which gets fucking annoying quickly. I hate them! Norman then finally arrives, then showing the two the drug, but they question its effectiveness just because Sanju and Mujika don't eat humans and are fine. This makes Norman paranoid, questioning himself by asking the evil blooded girl is still alive? And I'm sorry, but this shit just sounds lame as fuck. You couldn't be more creative with the name? Explaining what he knows, Norman reveals that Mujika is this evil blooded girl, saying that with just a sip of her blood, a demon would gain similar powers to her and will be fine without eating humans. Around 700 years ago, as communities started to share the blood with each other, the king of the Land, found out, then captured and murdered every demon who had obtained this power. Because if spread anymore, it would ruin their own amount of power. But even so, Mujika was able to escape. Okay, so we have Mujika, a demon who, just by sharing her blood, can create a chain reaction of demons not needing to eat humans, which can create harmony between demons and humans. Great, right? <laughs> no, because Norman's a stubborn little cunt, he just wants revenge. Wow, that's so interesting. He keeps making up excuses on why this wouldn't work, revealing that they can't even take humans to the human world. World because the entry to the human world Emma and Ray saw on the map doesn't exist anymore, and that the only one left is at the headquarters in Gracefield Farm, where they escaped from, and that it's basically impossible to get to, blah blah blah, I don't give a fuck, shut the fuck up. Both sides keep whining and shit because Norman is now this fucking Sigma we'll alpha male fuck, fuck women type fuck of dude. Wrong. Until Emma makes a deal, she'll find Mujika and Sonju for Norman, then he can't annihilate the demons, but they only have five days to return with them, otherwise the deal is off. Now, 
I might just be stupid, but doesn't Norman want to kill Sonju and Mujika? How would bringing them to him be a good idea? I might have missed something here, but so much shit gets thrown into your face in this scene, but it felt like I couldn't focus on anything. Once Emma and Ray leave, Norman and his gang meet up and discuss what new info they now know, which results in Barbara having a temper tantrum, then having what's called a Lambda Seizure. Apparently the seizure is normal for Zazi, Sislo, Barbara and Vincent, as they were experimented on and don't have much time left, but Norman's apparently fine as he just took Tess. You know how I said Emma was stupid for making this deal with Norman? Well it turns out that when they're back, he'll kill Mujiko and Sonju, and that the original plan still hasn't changed, as we then see the experiments they've been doing on a large demon. Back at the castle, Emma tells the rest of the kids their plan, and after some initial disagreement, they all begin to support Emma with her idea. As the sun rises, we cut to Norman, experiencing a seizure and coughing up blood, showing us that he's just been lying about only taking Tess at Lambda. We then see a previous memory of Norman's, the night he was shipped out. It turns out, as those doors opened up upon Norman's shipment back in Season 1, a man was actually waiting behind there, Mr. Ratchery. No, not James Ratchery, the one known as William Minerva, but Peter Ratchery, James's younger brother and the gatekeeper to the human world at this time. Peter asks Norman for his assistance in research, and despite knowing that something's off, he has no choice but to agree. The next few scenes show the extent of what Norman did at Lambda, taking tests and living somewhat normally, as Peter calls him the first genius since the establishment of the farms, then continuing with the era of James Ratchery as the gatekeeper as ended. From now on, I will control the children of the farms. I don't like Peter's presence in the story. With season 1 its complexity came with how carefully crafted the story and characters were, with twists and turns that connected in a brilliant way. But here in season 2, it's more dumbed down with very boring reveals that come out of nowhere in a bad way. As we see Norman come to meet Vincent, along with what everyone had been subjected to at Lambda, Norman makes a plan to blow the place up, which he succeeds at doing. Escaping with his newly acquired friends, he gathers all the data Lambda had, whilst promising the eradication of all demons. Switching back to the present, we see Don, Gilda, Ray and Emma on their journey to find Mujika and Sonju as they go from point to point, mapping out everywhere they go as they avoid wild, degenerated demons. Through all of this, Norman and his crew are still preparing for their attack despite the agreement set in place. After a day or so, Emma and everyone go to an unexplored portion of the map and finally find what seems like footprints to the horse Sonju rides. But as they follow them, we once again switch back to Norman, standing on the edge of a cliff, monologuing about how he's not wavering from his plan, and that in order to save the children from all the farms, he would gladly become a god or a devil. I get that, in the end, Norman's intentions are good, like he wants what's best for all the children. Yeah, I fucking hate how edgy they make him out to be in this season. And don't just fucking tell me your plans and shit. What made season 1 so amazing was how Ray and Norman in particular made their actual plan secret even to the viewer. But here there's no mystery in anything, it's just a boring way to express his desire to kill demons. That night, Emma and the rest of the group are attacked by a giant wild demon, with Emma distracting the demon by shooting it before running away. Right as the demon's about to catch up to Emma, Ray comes in and shoots it in the eye, then dropping to the floor. With it seemingly dead, everyone calms down a bit until Revealing that they found them because Emma dropped her amulet, Sonju and Mujika ask why they're there in the first place, but not before an explosion goes off in the distance. Norman has betrayed Emma and set off the drug anyway, leaving many demons disfigured shells with no intelligence. This whole scene is actually pretty good, despite the demons eating humans, I still thought it was pretty sadly disturbing to see them all running around in terror. I almost humanised them a bit. As Norman and his crew wreak havoc, the older demon from a few episodes ago meets Norman as he tries to kill his granddaughter. Yet the drug has no effect on him, meaning that he is indeed the same as Mujika and Sonju. Seeing the bond between him and his granddaughter, Norman begins to waver, only to stop himself from killing the two demons when Emma and Ray arrive with Sonju. As Emma notices Norman's near remorse, she monologues about how he should share his suffering with them, and that it's not too late to turn back, calling him strong and kind, yet an arrogant coward. As Norman breaks down, Emma offers a shoulder to lean on. As Norman reveals that due to the drugs given to him at Lambda, he won't live much longer. Just as a degenerated demon is about to attack, Mujika, Don and Gilda arrive, with Sonju cutting off his arm and feeding it to the demon to reverse the effects of Norman's drug. With scenes of disaster following, we see Barbara about to kill the two young demons we've seen all throughout this season, begging for their lives to be spared. This is one of the only good things about this season. The way it's been able to humanise the demons was really good. It really showed that it's not so much the middle class and such demons that are bad, they just didn't know about Mujika's powers. But it's more headquarters that are 
the enemy. As Barbara breaks down with Cicelo helping her, the two demons are only spared when Norman forces them all to stop killing. Despite going against what he and his crew initially wanted, Norman says that he doesn't want to eradicate the demons anymore, with everyone changing their minds except Vincent. It was pretty pissed about it. With Sonji and Muchika arriving and confirming the recovery of the demons in the town, the kids go back to their hideout, only to be told that Phil and the rest of the kids are about to be shipped. Switching to headquarters, we see Peter having a meeting with the demons about the recent escape that happened at Lambda, with Isabella being brought back into the picture to bring the kids back. She reveals that when searching the shelter, the radio that was supposed to be there was missing. I don't know how they knew there was a radio there. Like it was supposed to be a secret hideout, it didn't necessarily have to have a radio. And so, they sent out a fake transmission to bring the kids back to Gracefield. Peter then states that the Lambda project will be started, with a new method of raising high quality children using drugs will be used, and that the so called yearly harvest will no longer be just once a year for the high ranked demons. And I hate how all of Isabella's humanity was just taken again. Like she was finally chilled up because they were too lazy to think of anything else, it just made her evil again. Back at the castle, Norman questions whether or not all the data from Lambda was destroyed, and that Phil and the others might be getting shipped to a farm like Lambda to start the project. Project. Even after Ray states that it might be a trap, Emma still has a resolve to save him no matter what. As Sonju and Mujika arrive, the early demon finally introduces himself as one of the demons she saved 700 years ago, Vilk. Handing something to his granddaughter who hands it to Emma, a part of a pen falls into her hand. He says that he found it with a near dead man some 15 years ago, who before his passing stated, give this to the children of the farms, let it give them a glimmer of hope. He then ate the human, but even so, he recognised that the human had a will just like them, but he ate humans for regardless in order to hide the evil blood within him. As Emma puts the part onto the pen, it reveals a map of the entire farm, along with the placements of guards, wiring, and the building circuitry. It's essentially a guide on how to escape to the human world. It even includes how to make the cure for Norman's and the other's side effects of the drugs they were forced to take. With all this info being brought due to Vil, he seems glad that he was able to help the kids out, but before leaving, Norman goes to apologise, but is instead stopped by Vilk's granddaughter. He apologises instead for what her kind did to the human race. And with that, Vilk leaves and all the kids head to bed, happy with their newfound discoveries, yet that doesn't stop one person from being an absolute cunt. The next day, everyone gets together to come up with a plan to save the kids and escape with everyone. In a nutshell, they have to rescue Phil and the others, who have all been relocated to the varying four plants preceding the fire, along with the other 40 kids in each plant, and get to the basement headquarters lowest level using one of the elevators there. With this, they also have to watch out for any of the sisters, along with the estimated 30 to 40 demons on guard. With this, Vincent tells Peter via the radio of their plan to escape because apparently they've lost touch with reality. Firstly, the kids will be using hot air balloons to disperse the drug that degenerates demons onto the guards. Then they'll land to get all the children before taking off into the sky, assumingly to go to headquarters and then the basement. We see Isabella confirm preparations for this drug dispersion to be prevented, and she does this really off-putting smile that uh, just looks goofy as ever. The next day, we see one of the farms gathering all the children and their suitcases before we switch to Emma and everyone else doing their preparations. And finally, everyone heads out to escape once and for all, heading to the different plants. But with headquarters already knowing, they had demons stationed just to destroy the hot air balloons. But even inspecting them, no one resided in them, with instead the demons being blown up by explosives, also known as a trap. As Sonju and the Lambda defects land and kill off the enemy, Emma and everyone else go off to Gracefield Farm and use a well to traverse underneath the farms. I don't remember anything about this well, I think it was just put here for some good old plot convenience. And is it me? Was well, the pacing of this entire season felt off? Like they'll spend 10 minutes on a sequence of them training for something, then the actual thing they were training for just lasts 2 seconds. Finally reaching an underground facility where the young kids change into some clothes as Phil and the others, they then sneak into where Phil and the others were and hands them a note from Emma, probably labelling their plan. Simultaneously, Vincent connects to the system in headquarters where their actual attack finally begins, with Vincent saying how he double crossed Peter and he is still on Norman and Emma's side before shutting down headquarters electricity. Whatever yeah, ill words I said about Vincent before, I didn't mean it. Cunt. The headquarters audio now connected to a headset Emma stole from a demon. She tells all the kids to run and play tag, and as they run past the inner gate, Vincent locks the sisters inside, preventing them from capturing the kids. With Phil guarding them, because he apparently knows the entire layout of headquarters now, we switch to Emma with some kids, who finally stumble upon the elevator before Phil and his group arrive, then subsequently, everyone else does as well. With everyone finally there, Emma pulls the switch to the elevator.
with tons of sisters around. <laughs> fuck, what the fuck? Sound like I'm James Charles. What the fuck? We finally see the mastermind behind all of this, Isabella, who is now apparently a grandma, with Peter shortly arriving after, with all the sisters now back online. With nothing else to do, everyone puts down their weapons as Isabella and Peter come downstairs to them. Peter also does this awkward little kick. It just looks fucking stupid like it didn't even go far, dude. With Emma protesting against Peter, Isabella suddenly pulls her gun onto him, revealing her true intentions as the other sisters point their guns at him as well. And ah, ha, ha, yeah, woo, she's a good guy, but like, why did it come out of nowhere in a really shit way again? In the first season, we would get very slight hints at things to help us figure shit out, but in this season, it just feels like they were making shit up as they go, just because there's no connections within the plot. Despite Isabella and the sisters joining Emma's side, it's revealed that there's still a large number of reinforcements heading their way, but just as hope seems futile, a shit ton of newly evil blooded demons break down the outer gate, expressing how they won't let the farms rule them anymore. Again, it's all just more plot convenience, like why are they attacking at exactly the right time to help out the humans? We know that it was Sanju and Mujica that told all the civilian demons about this, but if that's the case, why weren't they there just a little bit earlier? And also, how the fuck did Vilk and Mujica get to the elevator so quickly? Just 30 seconds ago, they were still outside, just not possible. With Peter brought to his he explains that you can't obtain peace without sacrifice, and to do that he upheld the promise made by his ancestors some 1000 years ago. Despite his wrongdoings, Emma still reaches out her hand to him, asking him to join them and be free. With that, we switch to Peter, monologuing about his experience being a part of a Ratchery clan. At one point in time, the head of the clan was his brother, James Ratchery aka William Minerva. That until he found out the truth about the promise the Ratchery clan made 1000 years ago, James was Peter's hero. As James pained with guilt about this revelation, Peter thought it was wonderful, calling it a noble mission whilst James labels it as a punishment and a curse. Because of this disagreement, as the two got older, Peter ended up murdering James, saying that no matter how much it hurt, he had to protect the world. Switching back to the real world, Peter declines Emma's offer, calling everyone fools and that's the reason why they're meant to be eaten. Despite some pretty bitter words, Peter gives up, saying how they win and they can do whatever they want, before extending out a blade and... <laughs> And with that, the humans finally get to go to the other world. They even invite Isabella and the rest of the sisters along, despite all the wrongdoings they did against the children, seeing how they could still recognize that her love and kindness really was genuine. But she still did try and ship you out to demons that were gonna kill you. Like, as Emma bids Mujica and Vilk farewell, she heads back to the center and pulls the lever, subsequently turning the elevator on. Reaching the bottom, they are greeted with the gate to the human world that, when activated with a pen, opens up. And at last, they can all finally go through, except for Zazi, Barbara, Sislo, and our three main characters. The reason for this, being explained in a flashback, is to make another promise that's different from the previous one, and to also save every single child from every single farm and bring them to the human world, with Norman's group also on board with that idea. Don and Gilda, being the eldest children left, stay with the children to help protect them in the human world, along with Isabella as well. And finally, everyone except for our seven characters leaves to go to the human world. What proceeds is a collage of everyone living out their own lives in the human world, with Emma and the rest of the crew changing the demon world at the same time. Until one sunset, a familiar voice calls out to an older feel, as we then see Emma and the crew safe and sound, finally in the human world. And we are done! There's a lot to go over, so let's just get into it and end this video, with my final thoughts, all for comparison of the seasons. Okay, so you may be wondering a couple things about what the fuck we just covered, like, who the fuck is grandma? Why was help written all over a room in the hideout? Why the fuck is everything sold with that fucking pen? None of these questions and more are answered. No shit. But we at least know why season 2 was so dog shit, at least compared to season 1. By the way, I haven't read the manga, this is just research and criticism I've seen from, I don't know, fucking everyone. First of all, they skipped and straight up changed a lot of shit in season 2 from the manga. In fact, entire story arcs were just brushed aside. Important arcs, mind you, with 140 chapters being crammed into 6 episodes. And you know the demon royal families that we basically never see in the anime? Yeah, well, in the manga, they actually do shit and are very integral to the overall plot, unlike the anime. And in the 
the manga, Peter Rattree is actually a much more complex character. Also, you know how Isabella is barely in the second season and shows up just in time to turn on Peter Rattree? Well, apparently in the manga, she actually dies to atone for her sins. I was actually being an extremely layered and complex character that declares her genuine love for the kids whilst begging for forgiveness. Not just, ha ha, what's up guys, I'm here, and fuck you Peter, you fucking cunt. And probably one of the dumbest things the second season did was leave out many characters from the manga. Like, were they just trying to make people hate this show? Now, I don't know any of these characters, so I'm just speaking out of my ass, but characters that were left out include Yugo, who looks fucking sick, Lucas, Sandy, Violet, Andrew, and Lewis, a character supposedly complex and interesting, replaced by Vilk, someone who isn't even in the manga. There's also the demon god known as The One, who was apparently pivotal in the manga's ending, but only makes a quick appearance in the anime's ending, which again, don't know why you'd do that. There's a lot more that was skipped out on in the anime that was originally in the manga, to the point where I could make a video about that in itself, so I'll just leave it there. This video is too long to begin with. But don't worry, there's still more wrong with the second season. Just like how many plot points just led to fucking nowhere. A big one is the fact that Isabella was tasked with the role of finding the kids, yet nothing happens with this plot point. She never finds them, she just appears in the ending to backstab Peter. And also, what was Isabella's reward for if she captured all the kids? It's never even brought up again. Nor is the existence of that grandma. I still have no idea who the fuck she is. Another plot point just kind of forgotten about is how Sonju does actually want to eat humans as long as they're bred in the wild. Like this is a big thing to bring up just to completely ignore it for the rest of this season. A plot point that I still don't even understand is how in the hideout there was a room with the word help plastered all over the room. What the fuck? There are just so many plot points that could have been really interesting but just fall flat on the ground due to extremely shitty writing choices. Also the characters are just so much more stupid in season 2. The amount of times I would be screaming at the characters through my monitor was insane. Like Emma. Why were Norman says he needs to kill Mujica, you make a deal with him to bring her to him. And why would they go out hunting when they have all the food and crops they would ever need in the bunker, seeing as they were still being hunted at this time. It just doesn't make sense, seeing as in season 1, these same characters were all fucking geniuses compared to themselves in the second season. The second season of the show also felt so fucking lazy compared to the first. In the first season, parts in which the characters needed to make progression was done over episodes, whilst also being very secretive not only to others but to the viewers themselves. But in the second season, the sequences of their training just consist of still shots and short clips of them with each other happily training. Aha, they're demons who want to murder us, ah, huh? yeah! It's not like we're in an extremely bucked up situation or anything with, with one wrong move, move, move killing, killing everyone. It's just fucking boring. Another example of this type of laziness is the ending, which is very different to the manga. Here, it's just a collection of still shots showing what Emma and the crew do in the demon world, with still shots of everyone in the human world intertwining with them. Like, wow, so interesting. Scream if you love TPN season 2. It's probably the most boring ending to an anime I've ever seen. Fucking School Days' ending was better than this shit. Along with that, the thriller mystery aspect the manga is known for and the first season, it's just completely gone in the second season. The only time I was surprised while watching the second season was when Norman showed up. Because of this, the show has no actual value. You're not going to be constantly trying to figure out what's going to happen next. It'll either be something so predictable or so outlandishly stupid that it will just bore you. Like why try and use your head when you already know that plot convenience rules over this entire season? I could go on for fucking years about how shit this second season really is, but the only decent things about it being that the animation was alright and that it's only 11 episodes so you won't have to torture yourself for too long. So. I want to end this video on a high note and talk about what makes season 1 of The Promised Neverland so fucking brilliant. First of all, the first season is actually properly adapted, according to a couple of online sources, with around 37 chapters being adapted into 12 episodes compared to season 2 adapting chapters 38 to 81, but again, I can't say how accurately they did it because I haven't read the manga, but just going off the first season's rating, I think I can say that they did a good job of it. Next, the characters. Each and every single character, minor or major, are so fucking incredible. I don't know how to explain it, but I love how Norman and Ray are basically just as smart as each other, yet their intelligence is so incredibly different. All of the characters' personalities raise conflict in the show in a way that makes you question their morals and true reasons for doing shit is insane, with Isabella being a great example of this because you never know if she's telling the truth or not. Not only that, but it was great how with each of our three main characters' weaknesses, it would be made up for with another strength. All the characters are all very complex as well, having multiple layers and depth to their personalities. Moving on to an aspect that was 
just done incredibly with the thriller and psychological and just all the themes in the season. Each and every single episode from start to finish leaves you on the edge of your seat, trying to constantly figure out what's going to happen next. It's mysterious, disturbing, suspenseful and even distressing at times, but it's done in such a brilliant and complex way that makes a lot of sense unlike season 2. I've never had this many trust issues with an anime just because you never truly know who is actually trustworthy in the season. You're just constantly wondering if a character is an enemy or an ally. These themes are complemented very well with its extremely unique and interesting plot and plot points. It really is an absolutely thrilling concept that's like experiencing a deep hate trip. The pacing of the show is also very good, with plot points not being too squeezed together or rushed like in season 2, which in return created a cohesive story that despite its complexity wasn't too difficult to follow along to. The world building in the show was also great, as it left a lot up to the imagination yet told us what we needed to know. Finally, the animation and design of the characters is great, and although it's not some mapper level animation, it fits the show perfectly with any remotely action oriented scene not being too dramatic as it's not the main focus of the show. The story is. The characters all look unique, having designs that I haven't seen in any other anime, except for maybe Ray, who kind of has the emo tryhard look going. Also, whenever the characters are experiencing something horrifying, you really feel like these are real kids in these distressing situations, especially due to the face they pull. The only negative I have about the first season is that I thought some of the characters felt a bit too goofy or too tryhard at times, like Sister Crone being an unhinged fucking weirdo, and Ray being a bit tryhard edgy. But apart from that, the Promised Neverland season one was fucking brilliant and deserves all the praise it's received since its release, while season 2 just kind of fucking sucks. My final rating for the first season is a 9 out of 10, and for the second season, a 5 out of 10, with the average score of the entire show amounting to a 7 out of 10. Comparing the two seasons isn't really even worth it, with season 1 being one of the best anime ever made, and season 2 being one of the worst. Thanks for watching the video, I really do appreciate it. Now this video probably is gonna take a while to come out so just sorry about this taking so long and i will start to have a better upload schedule soon probably i work a lot and with that i'll see you in the next upload cheers